Hey guys, this is the second video of the series on statins. In part one, we covered the benefit side of the equation. Do statins work? How much? How much benefit can we expect? So check that out if you haven't yet. Today we're going to start looking at the risk side of the equation. And in this video, we're going to focus on diabetes, even though it's not the most common side effect of statins, but it's probably the most feared and possibly the most misunderstood. In the next videos in the series, we'll focus on muscle pains and other potential side effects. Now, as we said in part one, in this series of videos, we're going to show you evidence that you've never seen before. Statins have become a very emotional, a very visceral topic on the internet with everybody fighting over them. But rarely are people shown the key information they need to make an educated decision. So this series is our attempt to change that. Quick disclaimer, when it comes to statins, people worry a lot about conflicts of interest. As I said in part one, I've never made a cent from statins or any other drug my entire life. I don't have any ties to industry. I don't care if they make money or lose money. So we can all relax about that. My only job here is to give you access to the evidence at the highest level so you can make an informed decision. That's it. What that decision ends up being, that's between you and your doctor. Okay, we got that out of the way. Let's get into it. And today we're going to try something a little different. Cardiovascular disease is not some academic topic. It's literally life and death. So instead of going through the facts coldly and cerebrally, I'm going to reason through it with you guys like I'm making a decision for a close family member. And I'll use my mother as an example, right? So we're going to go over the facts of statins and diabetes like I'm trying to decide what I'm going to recommend for her, what's best for her health. This might be interesting for some people to see how someone who does science and reads science for a living but is not a board-certified cardiologist or a lipidologist uh, navigates this information, right? When the stakes are high, not some abstract exercise, not an internet game. So what would I do if my own mother had high cholesterol and high enough risk that a statin was indicated? If you're a regular viewer, you probably know that there's a lot we can do with lifestyle. We published numerous videos on how to lower cholesterol and ApoB with diet. But sometimes that's not enough, whether it's because people have genetic constraints or because they're a very high, very high risk, what's called secondary prevention. Somebody who has already had a heart attack or a stroke or has extensive plaque, in those cases, we got to be more aggressive. So there is a place for medication as well. So what would I do if a statin is indicated for my mother, but I heard about this diabetes risk and I want to look into it? Ideally, we want to look at randomized controlled trials. Volunteers are split randomly. You give half a statin, half a placebo. So just a pill with no drug in it. And then we look at how many people develop diabetes in each group. Now, sometimes you can't do a randomized trial, sometimes for ethical reasons or for logistical reasons. But lucky for us, when it comes to statins, dozens have been carried out and they're all available. In this one, for example, the statin raised risk of diabetes by 25%. In this one, the statin had no significant effect. And in this one, the statin lowered risk of diabetes by 30%. Most trials that I've seen showed no significant effect either way. Now, if you're a regular viewer, you've probably heard me say that we got to take individual studies with a grain of salt. One solution is to look at a meta-analysis, which is where we take a bunch of different trials and we combine them all. And that can average out the variability of individual trials and give a more consistent answer. So here's one. They lumped 29 separate trials and they found an average 12% higher risk of diabetes in the statin group. Here's another meta-analysis. This one found a 9% increase in diabetes risk. But this one found no significant difference overall. And neither did this one. So at this point, people start to get annoyed normally. And this is where people will just pick the, the answer they like and run with it. Or they just give up and lose hope. I can't get a straight answer. Scientists can't agree on anything. Science is all a hoax. No need to panic. Just take a deep breath. Actually, the stuff we've seen so far gives us a ton of information. First of all, we see an effect often enough, and we see it in meta-analyses, that it's probably real. It's not a fluke. It's not like somebody made it up. And second, because we see the effect sometimes and not others, this tells me that it's probably context-dependent, which is great news. It's not a tragedy. Because if we can figure out the moving pieces, if I can figure out which contexts raise risk and which don't, then I can lower her cholesterol 
without raising her risk of diabetes. So can we find that sweet spot? And if so, how? So I went over these meta-analyses and I took a look at the studies that they include one by one. And there are three factors that determine risk of diabetes for someone on a statin. The characteristics of the patient at baseline before they start the statin, the dose of the statin, and the type of statin that the person is taking. So we're gonna go through these one by one. First, let's look at which characteristics of the patient determine if the person is at risk for diabetes or not. This large randomized control trial looked at 17,000 patients and basically counted how many had risk factors for diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, or prediabetes. Basically, their fasting glucose or their glycated hemoglobin was above normal, but not quite in the diabetic range yet, so it was intermediate. Now, for people who had one or more of those risk factors, the statin treatment reduced their risk of cardiovascular outcomes, that's things like heart attacks or strokes, by 39%, and reduced their overall risk of death by 17%. But it also increased their risk of diabetes by 28%. On the other hand, for people without those diabetes risk factors, the statin reduced cardiovascular outcomes by 52%, total death by 22%, and there was no significant increase in diabetes risk. So I draw two major takeaways from this. Number one, the risk of developing diabetes on a statin is mainly a concern for people who are already at risk of diabetes, who are already heading there, and the statin may speed up that process a little bit. In the case of my mother, she doesn't have these risk factors, so I would be a little less concerned about that. And the second takeaway is that the benefits of the statin outweigh the risks in both groups, both for people with and without risk factors for developing diabetes. In the author's words, the cardiovascular and mortality benefits of statin therapy exceed the diabetes hazard, including among those at higher risk for developing diabetes. In absolute terms, in the group at risk for diabetes that had those risk factors, this boiled down to about two cardiovascular events avoided per new case of diabetes. So about a two-fold benefit to risk ratio. And that's about the lowest I've seen. I've seen some studies that estimate a three-fold ratio, others a five-fold, and some as much as ten-fold benefit to risk. I always like to give you an idea of the range so you know what to expect, rather than one number from one random study, then you find a different number out there, and scientists can't agree, we go down that slide, right? So this is what I've seen, two-fold to ten-fold in that ballpark, depending on the specifics. Doesn't mean we can't find an individual who's an outlier. In medicine, you can always find an exception, and we'll actually circle back to this in the end of the video. So these considerations of risk-benefit are absolutely crucial. Every decision in life is risk-benefit, right? Nothing is 100% risk-free, not even getting out of bed in the morning. And the same in medicine. Every drug, every intervention has risks, has potential side effects. That's why just listing side effects, I sometimes see people doing this on social media. Hey, this thing has all these side effects. That's not helpful by itself. It doesn't give you the information you need to make an educated decision. Now, when we say twofold, threefold, tenfold, we're just comparing the numbers directly, risk to benefit, but in reality, this is not apples to apples. Being diagnosed with diabetes means an elevation in your blood glucose levels. Not good. Nobody wants it. I certainly don't want that for my mother. But that's not in the same galaxy as having an actual heart attack or a stroke or dying of coronary heart disease, obviously. And this is spelled out by these authors for the European Atherosclerosis Society. A case of diabetes should not be compared with outcomes like stroke or death from myocardial infarction. So, a heart attack. We're not downplaying diabetes. Everything on the internet is oversimplified and blown into a caricature. Oh my God, he just said diabetes doesn't matter. No, diabetes is a bad diagnosis, lots of bad consequences, but it sure as heck beats a heart attack or dying. Diabetes raises the risk of complications down the line. Heart attacks and strokes are the complications. By the way, I've heard people say, well, diabetes, raises cardiovascular risk, raises risk of heart attacks. So there's no point taking statins because if statins raise risk of diabetes and diabetes raises risk of cardiovascular disease, no point taking statins in the first place. This is a colossal misunderstanding. We already know that the net result of taking a statin is a reduction of cardiovascular disease and even overall mortality. We just saw that. So that's not the concern with diabetes. 
The net result of the statin is lower cardiovascular disease risk. But we still don't want to get diabetes if we can avoid it, even if that other stuff is better off. So based on what we've seen so far, if this was all the information I'd had, I would recommend she take the, the statin, even if she had those risk factors for diabetes, the obesity, the prediabetes, which she doesn't. But what I would do is I would keep looking for ways to minimize her risk further. Now, before we move on to the second factor, the dose of statin, age may also raise susceptibility to developing diabetes on a statin. And my mother is in her mid-70s, so that's another reason I would keep looking at these other factors to see what else we can play with. So the second factor that's important is statin dose. This meta-analysis compared a higher dose, 80 milligrams a day, to a lower dose, 20 or 40. And the risk of developing diabetes on the higher intensity regimen was 12% higher than on the moderate dose. This other meta-analysis also looked at this issue of dose. A statin given at a high dose, 80 milligrams per day, raised diabetes risk by 34%. But the same statin at 10 or 20 milligrams had no significant effect on diabetes risk. So this is another element I would bear in mind, especially if my mom had some of those risk factors for diabetes, the obesity, the prediabetes, right? It doesn't mean I would be inflexible. It doesn't mean the low dose of statin would be non-negotiable. I would want to weigh the pros and cons. Uh, for example, a higher dose of statin can also lower cholesterol more. So it would depend on how high her cholesterol is, how high her risk is, how much we need to push that down, right? I would be open to the high dose of statin if the benefits justified it. That's always the logic. Another strategy that might be best of both worlds is to use a lower dose of statin and then combine that with a non-statin cholesterol lowering drug like azetamide or a PCSK9 inhibitor. Both have been demonstrated to lower cardiovascular risk in large randomized controlled trials and neither one significantly raises diabetes risk. Here's an example. This trial compared 20 milligrams of rosuvastatin to 10 milligrams of rosuvastatin plus 10 milligrams of azetamide. Both of those treatments were equally effective at lowering cardiovascular risk, but the combo had 50% less problems due to intolerance. And this analysis just came out looking at long-term exposure to PCSK9 inhibitors. The volunteers were on a statin and then half of them were put on a PCSK9 inhibitor for up to eight years total. And the PCSK9 inhibitor lowered cardiovascular risk further, but did not significantly raise diabetes risk. So those are two really good options to bring those values down further in people who need it, while at the same time keeping the statin dose moderate. Okay, the last of the three factors is the type of statin. There are actually seven types of statin with different characteristics, different molecules, and some evidence suggests that they have different effects on diabetes risk. This meta-analysis found that atorvastatin raised diabetes risk by 34% and rosuvastatin by 17%. But the other statins they looked at did not have a significant effect. Simvastatin, pravastatin, lovastatin, and pitivastatin. Simvastatin looked maybe borderline, and the other three looked the most reassuring. This other meta-analysis found pretty similar results overall. Atorvastatin and rosuvastatin trended towards an increase in risk, and the rest of the statins looked safer. Pravastatin and lovastatin had no significant effect, and pitivastatin actually lowered risk of diabetes in this analysis. Although I wouldn't harp on that too much, sometimes you see an improvement, a lowering of diabetes risk, with pitivastatin, sometimes you just see no significant effect. I looked around for analyses that were specifically focused on pitivastatin, and Tom Dayspring sent me this one. So this meta-analysis focused specifically on pitivastatin trials, and it found no significant effect of the statin on fasting blood glucose, hemoglobin A1c, or risk of diabetes. So some statins are consistently seen to not raise diabetes risk. It could be intrinsic to their properties, or it could be the dose. Pitivastatin, for example, is usually prescribed at lower dose. Also bear in mind, these factors work together. So even the statins that do show an effect on risk of diabetes, like atorvastatin or rosuvastatin, we normally see it with higher doses, while lower doses of the same statin, like five or 10 milligrams a day, show no statistically significant effect. So remember in the beginning of the video when we were going through the individual trials and it seemed like it was all over the place? Some showed an effect and some didn't. These three key factors might explain that variability. 
depending on the type of statin and the dose of statin, etc., sometimes we might see a risk of diabetes, increased risk of diabetes, and sometimes not. So when we see people often on social media really frustrated, we can't rely on science, you can find a study to support any idea you want, right? We've all heard this. Yeah, if we pluck an isolated study and we're not sure what's going on there, maybe we're just going by the title or the summary. A lot of times this happens with media headlines. Yeah, that can be incredibly confusing. But if we look at the balance of evidence and if we understand a couple of the key moving pieces, then things often fit together really nicely. And a lot of these apparent contradictions kind of just dissipate away. So bottom line, I would take all of this information on board, the three key factors, when I'm making a decision, when I'm talking to my mother, when I'm talking to her cardiologist, right? Okay, she doesn't have those risk factors for diabetes. That's good. Can we put her on a low dose statin? Yes or no? Does that make sense for her case? Can we put her on one of the statins that doesn't seem to raise risk of diabetes? Yes or no, right? It's all up for discussion. The better information we have, the better decisions we make, always. The other thing I would do is I would keep an eye on her glucose levels, her fasting glucose levels, and her glycated hemoglobin. And nowadays you can measure your glucose at home with a handheld device. What, 20 bucks on Amazon? In like one minute you measure it. Or you can measure hemoglobin A1C, glycated hemoglobin, every three months. And if her glucose levels start gradually drifting up over time, over months or years, then I'd consider making a change. I've talked to her cardiologist. Hey, this is happening. Can we put her on a different statin or a non-statin cholesterol lowering drug, right? And if her glucose stayed nice and flat, didn't drift up with time, then I'd be less concerned. So I'm gonna do everything in my power to avoid my mother developing diabetes, obviously. But I'm also gonna consider all the other factors to maximize her overall health. Okay, let's talk for a second about why some statins at some dose in some people raise risk of diabetes. What's the mechanism? It's not entirely understood, but one possibility is an increase in BMI, which is well known to raise risk of insulin resistance and diabetes. So this suggests yet another line of defense, which is to try and maintain a healthy body weight via lifestyle, healthy diet, physical activity, while the person is on the stat. This might help reduce, maybe even eliminate, any remaining risk of diabetes. Okay, one other thing I wanna point out, sometimes I see people on social media making claims like, statins double your risk of diabetes, often based on studies like this. So this is an observational study, which means there's no randomization. They just recruit a number of people from a population, some who are already on a statin and some who are not. There's nothing wrong with that, we just have to understand what we're looking at and not make logical leaps. If I pluck a group of people from a population, those who are more medicated may also be sicker to begin with, as opposed to a randomized controlled trial where I split people randomly and I give the statin to half of them. This phenomenon is so common, it even has its own name, confounding by indication. And it just means that people who have an indication to do more meds in general, will be sicker than those who don't. Now, that's not the end of the world because there are statistical ways to adjust for these differences. And when they adjusted for age, BMI, and other factors, that effect, that 2X effect that people talk about, the twofold, fell from 200% to 46%. And further adjustment reduced the effect even more. For example, fasting blood glucose was no longer statistically significant when completely adjusted. Also, the effect differed by statin type. It was significant for atorvastatin and simvastatin, but it was not statistically significant for the other statin types. Now, don't get me wrong. These observational studies, these epidemiological studies are not useless. Sometimes there's that misconception on the internet. They have some advantages. For example, scale and duration. You can follow 200,000 people for 30 years with an observational study. You can't do that with an RCT. So that's valuable. But this study that's often thrown around on the internet looked at 8,000 people for 5.9 years. That's the same scale as many of the randomized trials we looked at. Some actually had more people than this. So this study brings nothing to the table. It foregoes the rigors of randomization. It exposes us to confounders while getting nothing in return in terms of scale. Bringing up this study as an argument when we have all these trials that are much more rigorous with the same scale 
is just a complete misunderstanding of how these things are designed and what they mean. When we look at observational studies that are larger and longer, substantially longer than the trials, 90 years, 10 years, 20 years, okay, that's interesting. And there, the general picture is similar to what we've seen with the trials. Atorvastatin and rosuvastatin show about a 20-30% average increase in diabetes risk, while pravastatin and pitivastatin, for example, show no significant effect in most of these long observational studies. So, same ballpark, the numbers might change a bit, but there's no fundamental difference in the aggregate. And on that note, a common question that people ask with regards to statin trials because of the funding, because a lot of them, not all, but a lot of them are funded by pharmaceutical industries, people ask, can we trust these trials? Well, it's got nothing to do with trust. Trust is for friends and family, all right? In science, we look for methodological rigor and reproducibility. If the research is well done, sturdy, robust experimental design, and importantly, if I keep saying the same answer, across teams, across countries, across experimental approaches, across techniques, then my confidence goes up gradually. If the work is shoddy or if it's not reproducible, then the confidence is not there, regardless of who's paying for the research. So based on all the information we've seen, this would be my strategy. My mother doesn't have risk factors for diabetes, not obese, not pre-diabetic. If she was, I would try to work on those at the same time. Tweak the diet, the physical activity, to see if we can lose some excess fat mass that usually improves all of that. Then I would lean towards the statin types that don't significantly increase diabetes risk. Pravastatin, pitivastatin, lovastatin, see if those work for her. And obviously factor in with the suggestions from the cardiologist and his experience. If we have to go to a torvastatin or a rosuvastatin, I'd favor keeping it at a moderate dose, like five or 10 milligrams a day. If that doesn't bring her cholesterol to where it needs to be, everything else being equal, I'd rather add a zetamibe or a PCSK9 inhibitor on top before we start cranking up the statin dose. And I would keep an eye on her glycemia, her fasting glucose levels, and work on keeping the lifestyle as healthy as possible. So that would be my strategy. That minimizes her cardiovascular risk while at the same time keeping her diabetes risk as low as possible. Obviously, this process is personalized. Medication always is. That's, that's why we use my mom's example to make this real. So if we're talking about somebody who is at, is at a higher risk of developing diabetes, I would be even more criterious, even more vigilant, and really try to harness those factors we talked about. Let's take a second to think about the difference between having access to all this information, being able to design a strategy on one hand, versus being exposed to sound bites online. Some people saying, statins are perfect, add them to the drinking water, no concerns. Other people saying, statins are poison, they're killing everybody, they'll give you diabetes, nobody should be on them. How can anybody make an educated decision if that's the quality of the information they're exposed to? You can't. People who are exclusively exposed to this type of information all day long, they just get analysis paralysis. They freeze, they don't know what to do, so they do nothing. We have countless people exposed to cardiovascular risk for years and decades because of some vague idea of side effects like diabetes. They were not given the information to know what the real risks are and how to navigate this to maximize their benefit. Many studies have shown that after a negative statin story on the media, people are more likely to discontinue their medication and more likely to have heart attacks and die of cardiovascular disease. This doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. We should talk about it. We just did. But we talk about it in a level-headed way, giving people the tools to make a decision. Right? Not one-liners and boogeyman stories. This is the whole reason I started making these videos a couple of years ago. This is life-changing information. Everybody should have access to it. How are we not being told about this? Celebrity gossip, sports results, that comes to us. Whether we want it or not, it's shoved in our face all over the internet. Life-saving information takes a research project to find it. Is it just me or is this crazy? If we're about to buy a house or a car, we spend months researching it, even a phone sometimes. We even research these things for fun. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in the world. And we have people making this, these decisions on a coin toss, essentially, on a Facebook post that they saw, not because they don't care about their health, not because they're not smart, but because of the quality of the information they're exposed to. If it depends on me, we're gonna change that. 
So let me know your questions. Take care. See you next week.